So if we get into our scene here, let's see how this kind of thing applies. We've looked at cameras a little bit already. Really, we just put them in and I didn't explain much about them. So let's do it again. Let's put in another camera and I can explain more about the settings. So of course, to create a camera, you go to the create panel, plus button here, go down to not geometry, shapes, lights, but cameras. You'll have a standard camera, which really we don't need to discuss because those are just kind of a legacy item in 3D Studio Max that they keep here because they were the original cameras and they just haven't gotten rid of them. Maybe they're more compatible with more things than the physical camera. But either way, we're going to use the physical camera because it's the better way to go. So there's standard, target, free, but then here's the physical camera. This one has all the settings we were talking about. So I'm going to put this in maybe here and you just click where the camera is going to be and drag for the target. As you can see the target is that little square on the end and that's where it's pointing to. Let's go to the front view and place it properly. We'll need to make sure the target and the camera are moving. If you click on it and hit C, you'll look through that camera. Okay, now that's a pretty bad view. Down here we have all the tools for adjusting. We can truck the camera, which means basically move it side to side. We've talked a little bit about composition and how our safe frames are important for composing our scene. If you go to render setup, of course, we can adjust our safe frames. So our this yellow box is the proportions of our rendering, which look decent right now. We might have to adjust those. Let's try it just as a square like that. Let's see if we can get a cool composition this way. Obviously, we need to zoom our camera in a lot more. We select the camera by right clicking here where it says physical camera and go to select camera. Or we can just do it in the top view or something. Now we want to bring the camera in by dollying the camera. Bring it in nice and close. Let's get some wireframe edges on. Now you can see how everything's getting a little bit skewed. That's because I'm on too wide of an angle with this camera. It's not really wide angle, it's 40, but I want it even more in. So let's now bring the camera back out. And you can see now all my lines are kind of looking a little more straight and less skewed. This button here, the truck camera button, will kind of pan around in that scene. And I actually want to come down low here like this. Now I want to look up with my target. For that I use the pan camera. That's pretty cool. That's actually a nice composition right there. And let's zoom out a little bit, just slightly. I don't want to see the front edge of that table. I want to be right about there, actually. But I want a little space around my objects. So something like that is kind of cool. Now what I want to do with this scene is make some depth of field, like we talked about. Right now we have the exposure over here, the exposure settings in the camera that we talked about in the infographic. So focal length. Aperture F over 8. Okay, so that setting right there is adjusting our aperture. If we put it really, really low, like F over 2, then that brings in a lot of light for exposure, but it also makes a small depth of field, which is kind of what we want, or a shallow depth of field. Down here you can see our exposure is on. Another setting for exposure that we need to pay attention to is found, oddly enough, under Rendering, Environment. And you can see that here, exposure control for our scene overall is set to physical camera exposure control, which is fine. When you add the physical camera, it will turn this on, make it active. You can see this needs to, the physical camera exposure control is already installed, which it needs to be so that we can adjust this. So this just kind of overrides all the exposure settings here, and you can turn this up and down. You can do it manually and set your ISO the setting we talked about in the infographic, or you can put it at a target and it will just make it so that the camera exposes to a certain amount. Just probably the easiest way to do that. Here you can see the shutter speed, duration, 0.5 seconds, but enable motion blur. Okay, so if anything was moving in the scene, this virtual camera would be pretending like the shutter is open for 0.5 seconds. And so if anything is moving during a 0.5 second period, it will catch blur. 
Okay, we're not gonna have anything moving here, but that's how that works. The other thing we want to make sure we're getting is depth of field. You can see there's a setting for bokeh, parentheses, depth of field down here. Now to understand what bokeh is, I'm going to do a simple search in Google. Bokeh effects. You've seen it before, but you might not know what it's called. There's a bunch of bokeh effects. Okay. When you take a picture and you get something that's highly blurred, then light in the background of that blurred area will start to take on the shape of your shutter. So like right there, you can see that there's a shape to this light. Okay, they're all shaped the same. Those are bokeh effects. Bokeh effects, they're really cool looking. Um, especially, you know, things like this, really cool and artsy looking. Okay, but those are bokeh effects. And Google tells us all you need to know is that bokeh is the aesthetic quality of out-of-focus blur in a photograph. Okay, so there's a more technical definition, but that's okay. We don't need to know about it. So here you can see that you can set your aperture shape to circular or bladed with seven blades or whatever kind of blades you want, or you can put a custom shape in there. Okay, and that was those shapes of the light like I was talking about. Some other important things here, perspective control, auto vertical tilt correction is something that we use in architectural illustrations a lot. If you look again, Let's look at architectural photography and go to these images. Here's a perfect example right here. If you notice this building, all the vertical lines are perfectly vertical up and down, as opposed to like this one where you can see a three point perspective where it's, and this is actually pretty straight up and down. Let's see, let's find, let's find an example of a bad one. Not necessarily bad, but it's not the effect we're usually going for. Okay, like that. So this is one where you're looking up at the building, Rockefeller Plaza, and it's got a vanishing point towards the top. So that one does not have perspective control turned on. And what they do is use a tilt shift camera to take that picture. So with architecture, they usually do use a tilt shift lens to straighten out the verticals, just like this image you see here. And you can do that in 3D as well by using the auto vertical tilt correction. And on this one, there really is no vertical tilt going on. There's no skewing going on, so you don't see the difference. But you can see tilt and shift settings here, like that. With the vertical, that's actually shifting the lens. We'll set that back to zero. Shifting the lens horizontally, okay. If we turn off the auto here and we can do the tilt correction, you'll see that it'll tilt like that. But if you just set it to auto, it'll make sure it's always straight up and down. If you don't know what a tilt shift lens is, here's some pictures. And they actually tilt and shift. And that's what we were doing in 3D just now. And they use that. Here's a great example. Not tilt shift corrected. And this one is tilt shift corrected so that all the verticals are straight up and down. Okay, so we use that in architectural photography quite a bit. Okay, so that's a little more about the settings. And let's uh, try to get some nice renderings here and get some nice depth of field effects so I can show you how those work and we can show you how they can add to the quality of our imagery.